Welcome. This is the One Year Bible Reading for January 30th. We are starting today at the beginning of chapter 10 of Exodus, in which we are in the middle of the plagues. Then the Lord said to Moses, Return to Pharaoh and make your demands again. I have made him and his officials stubborn, so I can display my miraculous signs among them. I've also done it so that you can tell your children and grandchildren about how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and about the signs I displayed among them, so you will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, How long will you refuse to submit to me? Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, watch out, for tomorrow I will bring a swarm of locusts on your country. They will cover the land so that you won't be able to see the ground. They will devour what little is left of your crops after the hailstorm, including all the trees growing in the fields. They will overrun your palaces and the homes of your officials and all the houses in Egypt. Never in the history of Egypt have your ancestors seen a plague like this one. And with that, Moses turned and left Pharaoh. Pharaoh's officials now came to Pharaoh and appealed to him, How long will you let this man hold us hostage? Let the men go and worship the Lord their God. Don't you realize that Egypt lies in ruins? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. All right, he told them, go and worship the Lord your God, but who exactly will be going with you? Moses replied, We will all go, young and old our sons and daughters, and our flocks and herds. We must all join together in celebrating a festival to the Lord. Pharaoh retorted, The Lord will certainly need to be with you if I let you take your little ones. I can see through your evil plan. Never. Only the men may go and worship the Lord, since that is what you requested. And Pharaoh threw them out of the palace. Then the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the land of Egypt to bring on the locusts. Let them cover the land and devour every plant that survived the hailstorm. So Moses raised his staff over Egypt, and the Lord caused an east wind to blow over the land all that day and through the night. When morning arrived, the east wind had brought the locusts, and the locusts swarmed over the whole land of Egypt, settling in dense swarms from one end of the country to the other. It was the worst locust plague in Egyptian history, and there has never been another one like it. For the locusts covered the whole country and darkened the land. They devoured every plant in the fields and all the fruit on the trees that had survived the hailstorm. Not a single leaf was left on the trees and plants throughout the land of Egypt. Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you, he confessed. Forgive my sins just this once and plead with the Lord your God to take away this death from me. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and pleaded with the Lord. The Lord responded by shifting the wind, and the strong west wind blew the locusts into the Red Sea. Not a single locust remained in all the land of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart again, so he refused to let the people go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky, and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt, for three days. We don't know exactly what this is. Could have been a sandstorm, which is something that my husband certainly experienced when he was in Iraq. During all that time, the people could not see each other and no one moved, but there was a light. There was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. Finally, Pharaoh called for Moses. Go and worship the Lord, he said, but leave your flocks and herds here. You may even take your little ones with you. No, Moses said, you must provide us with animals for the sacrifices and burnt offerings for the Lord our God. All our livestock must go with us too. Not a hoof can be left behind. We must choose our sacrifices for the Lord our God from among these animals. And we won't know how we are to worship the Lord until we get there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart once more and he would not let them go. Get out of here, Pharaoh shouted at Moses. I'm warning you, never come back to see me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Very well, Moses replied. I will never see your face again. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will strike Pharaoh in the land of Egypt with one more blow. 
After that, Pharaoh will let you leave this country. In fact, he will be so eager to get rid of you that he will force you all to leave. Tell all the Israelite men and women to ask their Egyptian neighbors for articles of silver and gold. Now the Lord had caused the Egyptians to look favorably upon the people of Israel. And Moses was considered a very great man in the land of Egypt, respected by Pharaoh's officials and the Egyptian people alike. Moses had announced to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, at midnight tonight I will pass through the heart of Egypt. All the firstborn sons will die in every family in Egypt from the oldest son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the oldest son of his lowliest servant girl who grinds the flour. Even the firstborn of all the livestock will die. Then a loud wail will rise throughout the land of Egypt, a wail like no one has heard before or will ever hear again. But among the Israelites, it will be so peaceful that not even a dog will bark. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. All the officials of Egypt will run to me and fall to the ground before me. Please leave, they will beg. Hurry and take all your followers with you. Only then will I go. Then, burning with anger, Moses left Pharaoh. Now, the Lord had told Moses earlier, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but then I will do even more mighty miracles in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed these miracles in Pharaoh's presence, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he wouldn't let the Israelites leave the country. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. That same night they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs, and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. Put the blood of, on your doorposts, uh, excuse me, but the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see this blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now we're probably familiar with how this is a foreshadowing of Christ, uh, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world, the Passover Lamb. But other aspects of this Passover celebration are interesting as well. Let me share just a couple with you. So inside their homes, the Israelites ate a meal of roasted lamb, bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast. Unleavened bread could be made quickly because the dough did not have to rise. Thus, they could leave at any times, any time. Bitter herbs signified the slave bitterness of slavery. Eating the Passover while dressed for travel was a sign of the Hebrews' faith. Although they were not yet free, they were to prepare themselves, for God had said he would lead them out of Egypt, and their preparation was an act of faith. Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage and sent them out to work. At nine o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace and saw, saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them that he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. 
So they went to work in the vineyard. At noon and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. At five o'clock that afternoon, he was in town again and saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. The landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at five o'clock were paid, each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed that they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people only worked one hour, and yet you've paid them just as much as you paid us who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want to do with my money? Should you be jealous because I am kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. Listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged with a whip, and crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the other 10 disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of this world lorded over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Psalm 25, a Psalm of David. O Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced, but disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me, for you are the God who saves me. All day long I put my hope in you. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love, which you have shown from long ages past. Do not remember the rebellious sins of my youth. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. He leads the humble in doing right, teaching them his way. The Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness all who keep his covenant and obey his demands. For the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. They will live in prosperity and their children will inherit the land. The Lord is a friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. My eyes are always on the Lord for he rescues me from the traps of my enemies. Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit, 
Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. I love that encouragement to work as the ant because I am too often the sluggard myself. Returning to Selwyn Hughes with Psalm 128. This focused on the verses that say, your wife will be like a fruitful vine, your sons will be like olive shoots. Here the psalmist shows how the blessings of God are worked out in the lives of those who fear him and walk in his ways. The illustration he chooses is influenced by Hebrew culture, in which a recognized sign of contentment was a wife with many children who gathered and grew around her table, fruitful vine and olive shoots. He does not intend us to believe that the way to be blessed by God is to have many children and to hang on to them as long as we can. What he is saying in using this image is this, the blessing of God has within it the power to increase and abound. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says on this point, life consists in the constant meeting of souls, which must share their contents with each other. The blessed give to the others because strength instinctively pours from him and up around him. The characteristic of blessing is to multiply. The world thinks that blessing and contentment comes from getting, but scripture says it is more blessed to give than to receive. The problems of those countries in the third world where there is famine and great hunger could be resolved overnight if governments and authorities were to pursue the well-being of others in the same way that they pursue their own. The blessing of God flows to those who have learned that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Givers will find that when they give, their vitality increases and the people around them become fruitful vines and olive shoots around their tables. I did a study once about these olive shoots because I was intrigued and uh, it's interesting. Look it up online to see what these olive shoots look like coming up around the olive tree and how enduring they are, how, um, uh, how they can survive despite uh, oppression. So it is an encouragement to see what the natural world shows us. O oh God, our Father, help us lay hold of the truth that we have been confronted with today, that the characteristic of blessing is to multiply. May we model this in every way and every day, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So go and pour yourself out today, because the work of the Lord is not fragile, but lasting. Love you all. Have a beautiful day.